you have your Bibles, go ahead and pull them out. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew 5 this morning <clears throat> as we continue our um, look at the Sermon on the Mount, our study. And uh, what a powerful, powerful message. As a matter of fact, it's as many would, would believe and say the, the greatest message ever get it, given, that being Jesus speaking the Sermon on the Mount to his disciples, teaching us how to live. Uh, our lives uh, and, and to seek his kingdom and so Matthew 5 and we're going to talk this morning ultimately about being salt and light in a lot of ways we're going to also review what we talked about last week uh, because this really is application uh, as far as the salt and light aspect of what we talked about in the Beatitudes so we're going to walk through those one more time and you said, well, I was here last week, I heard it. I promise you, you're going to be, you need to hear it again. Uh, we could read these every single day. So we're living in, a, in, a, in an interesting time. Um, there's a lot of us that are just, just kind of in a bewildered state. Uh, we, we have experienced so much just doom and gloom and, and bad news. It's almost as if for, for many uh, not only in our society, but even within the church, our lives are just marked by uh, just blah. <laughs> no other, other better way to say it. And, and we just, we, we've quit living. We're just existing. And we're, we're just kind of anticipating the next bad event or news to take place. And, and in a lot of ways, and I've said this many times before, and I'll say it again, in a lot of ways we've quit dreaming. Dreaming about what God could do through us and what God wants to do in us and in that preferred future and, and ultimately in that living again if, if we have no no ability to dream and to to really believe that God uh, has us here for a purpose then then we will cease to live and when I look at our society and I look at just people as a whole that's where we are by and large but that certainly should not be where the church is. You and I should be on the very much on the offensive side. We should be living life uh, to the fullest and believing that God has and is going to do something in and through us. And some of you that, that join me online, you said, aren't we going through an end time study and, and aren't all the signs just kind of lining up that, that Jesus is, is, is going to return? And listen, he is and everything's lining up and we know and all of that but here's the deal is that he may tarry for another 50 years or 100 years he, he may have planted us here for the very purpose to push hell back to see God's kingdom go forth to usher in a great revival a movement of God we don't know what God's doing we know the signs of the time but but here's the deal let's just say that he comes back tomorrow and we put in practice today what we've learned and and he comes and, and he takes us out there's so much before us right there's so much to gain even in the loss of our lives there's so much to gain as Paul says because God has so much for us if we put in practice what he's telling us to do and he comes back then guess what he finds us faithful so it's a win-win situation but in the same sense let's say he tarries for another hundred years and this is our time that he's put us here to live the spirit-filled anointed life, in essence, to push hell back, for the kingdom to come, for God's will in heaven to be done on earth. He put us in, in the position to make a difference, but all we do is just kind of sit on our hands and say, you know, it's like really, really bad, and, and, and I, I know he's coming back, and I'm just going to bury my treasures and my talents, and I'm just going to sit there, and I'm just going to wait because I, I don't know what else to do. As a matter of fact, I think Jesus has a parable about that. Instead of living life to the fullest, even in the midst of our brokenness for his kingdom. Matter of fact, when Adam was created, God called Adam and he said, Adam, he said, I want you to have dominion on the earth. In essence, Adam was to rule on behalf of God. Adam was the one that represented God on earth. Now we realize that when Adam sinned, and Satan came along and, and deceived Eve and Adam's sin and he rebelled against God. There was a curse placed on Adam. The relationship between Adam and God was, was severed. And Satan became the prince and power of this era. And there was much that was lost. 
But I'll fast forward it to the point that where Jesus, God in the flesh, walked onto the scene. Went to the cross, paid our sin debt, conquered the sin for us, conquered the grave. Gave us eternal life, restored our relationship with God to where we could know him and he could live inside of us. Do you remember when, when Jesus was going through the 40 days of fasting and at the end of that, uh, or Satan came and he tempted and he tested him and he promised to give him the kingdom of the world? Jesus didn't rebuke him for that promise. But he wasn't going to bow down and worship him. Instead, what he did was he did what the first Adam didn't do. Jesus is known as the second Adam. He um, yielded himself to the word of God and trusted in God. And in all of that, what I'm trying to say is through the cross and through his sacrifice and his righteousness that was given to us, Jesus freed us and has given us life. In a lot of ways, we're called to represent his kingdom, to represent him on earth. And in a lot of ways, we have more power than what we ever dreamed that we have. If we will yield ourselves to him where the Spirit of God can do us and we can represent Jesus here on earth. And that is seen in our, in our prayer lives and in our yielding to God and then fleshing it out, living it out before a lost and dying world. Because it won't be us, it'll be Christ. In essence, for us to go out and have dominion in this world. Kingdom living, pushing back, God's kingdom going forth, calling heaven down to earth. Not by our own strength or in and of ourselves, but by Jesus living in us. He said, well, most of us, we have this mindset, well, if it's going to happen, it's already been preordained, it's going to happen, so it really doesn't matter. There's no rhyme or reason where if I live the way I'm supposed to as far as yielding myself to Christ or whether I pray or this, that, and that, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And I want to tell you something, that's not exactly correct. Because I can tell you in my own life, and I can give you a laundry list of things, that when I put the Beatitudes into practice, and we're going to walk through them again, and we're going to talk about salt and light, but when I put those things in practice, and, and I put myself on the altar, and I seek God's will, and, and I yield, and I ask God to fill me with His Spirit, and to give me direction in prayer, and I begin to seek His will, and pray His will into existence, I could give you a laundry list, I mean a laundry list, of answered prayer to where I've seen God move. And what I've done in private came out in fruition in public where, where it was known, it was seen, and God just showed up and hell was pushed back and heaven came down to earth and God did some extraordinary things. But I could equally give you a laundry list of times that I just kind of sat back and I was just like, blah, you know, is it going to change? Does it matter? Does God really, you know, here is, is it already kind of set in stone? And I didn't pray... And I didn't yield, and I didn't put myself in the altar. I didn't ask God to renew my mind. I didn't put Romans 12, 1 and 2 into practice. I just kind of existed. And you know what happened? Nothing. If anything, things went from bad to worse. Now, is God ultimately accomplishing His purposes? Yes. But He does not override our responsibility to represent Him on this earth and for us to be the hands and feet of Christ and for his kingdom going forth through us. So this deal of just advocating our role, saying, well, God's God, and whatever it's going to be is going to be, and I'm just going to exist, and I'm just going to be here in that state of just existing. Make no mistake about it, if that is our mindset, then we are not faithful to the calling that God has given us. And where he's firmly planted our feet. And we are certainly not salt and light into, in this lost and dying world. Matter of fact, look at verses 13 through 16. And we'll read through them real quick. And this is really the application side of, of the Beatitudes, of, of what, it, what it fleshes out. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But as the salt loses its flavor, he says, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and to trampled underfoot by men. Verse 14, he says, you are what? The light of the world. We're called to be salt, and, and we're also called to be light. He says, a city that set, is set on a hilltop cannot be hidden. He says, nor do uh, they light a lamp and, and put it under a basket. But what do they do? They put it on a lampstand for all to see. And it gives light to, to all the house, or to all that's in the house. He gives this command, let your light shine before men. 
that they may see your good works and see how you're living your life, how you're fleshing your life out before a dark, lost, and dying world, that they may see your good works and in that what? Glorify your Father in heaven. Now we're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit more about salt and light. But I want to hit the rewind button. And if, like I said, if you're hearing this again for the second time, it's okay. Bear with me. We need to hear it over and over and over again. Because in all reality, this part, what we call the Beatitudes, is really the foundational part of the message in which Jesus preaches or teaches. And then everything really flows out of these Beatitudes. So, so what, what he's going to do in, in large part is really um, just, just begin to share us with us in detail the next few weeks what these Beatitudes really mean. What they look like. And so going back to verse 3, just to remind you, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. That there, there's a blessing. There's a blessing when you get over yourselves and realize that you can't live this thing called Christian life. You can't muster up all the things that you think you, you got to muster up to, to be the man or woman that God wants you to be. God just wants you to, to, to just come before him and just broken and just say, God, I need you. You know what I do when I struggle with prayer? And sometimes I struggle in prayer as much as I talk about it. You know what I do when I really struggle in prayer? I just go before God and like, I am struggling. I don't have a heart for prayer. And when I pray, I feel like it's just hitting the ceilings. God, I can't see. I can't hear you. Open my eyes, Lord. God, be a man of prayer. Give me a heart for prayer. Is that just a time prayer that I pray and then it just solves all issues? No, sometimes I have to pray it over and over again. But I'll tell you this, I've never consistently prayed that, that God didn't answer. Sometimes immediate, sometimes it took weeks, but nevertheless, He always answers. So why did it take a longer time? God may be teaching me persistent prayer, which He makes very clear, and we'll talk about that even in, as we walk through uh, this, this great message over the next few weeks. But he said there's a blessing for one that's destitute before God. You know, I see a lot of apathy. I see a lot of anger. I, I, I see a lot of just existing, but I cannot tell you that I really see a lot of brokenness before God right now. And let's make no mistake about it. We're here where we are because of our sin. It's the church, collectively, our sin. Done, and how we've behaved, and the idols that we have in our lives. You know, I find it interesting that when you read Scripture, no matter how bad it is, no matter how bad Israel was, even in her in her rebellion, when you read through the, the minor prophets and the Old Testament and all of that, it seems that every time the people would humble themselves down and say, God, we have made a muck out of this. We, we are just in trouble. We are destitute. We're ready to get these idols out of our lives. God, we're, we're coming back to you. At the very least, God would hold back his judgment for a season. At the very least. But it hasn't happened yet. You say, well, I, I can't control. I can't, I can't change somebody else. No, but, but what about you? What about you getting alone with God and just saying, God, you know, I, I've, I've tried to do the thing in my own strength and I've just been playing the part. I haven't been asking you to fill me with been, been praying and crying out for your glory to rest upon me that I want to see you. See, I, I don't think we, we're seeing the glory of God. If, if we had a hunger and thirst for the glory of God, I'm telling you, we would spend much time in the secret place. And when you spend much time in the secret place and you stay there until you see the glory of God and you ask God to reveal himself to you, I promise you everything. All of a sudden, things of this world, I mean, in the, you go from doom and gloom to where you're hungering and thirsting for Him. 
He said there's a, there's, there's a blessing, there, there's an anointing. And I'll remind you, he's saying this to a group, by and large, that are extremely poor and that are under bondage. And by the time you get to 70 AD, the temple's just ransacked and destroyed. The Jewish community is scattered. And yet Jesus is giving this message on how to live. And even in that, when, when you get to the book of Acts, those do, that adhere to it and, and receive Christ, their own people are after them and destroy them. And there's a, a scattering because of that alone by their own people, let alone the Roman government. And he says that, that there, there's a blessing, there, there's an anointing. How many of you feel blessed right now? How many of you feel God's hand on your life? I was reading this week that Billy Graham's biggest fear in life that he was going to do something that would, God would take his hand off of him. He says in verse 4 that blessed are those that are mourning. And we, we talked about this last week. We said certainly it could... Could, could be one that's lost some, someone or something that mourning before God is, is really a good thing because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's poor in spirit. God, I can't get over this by myself. I need you. But here's the thing. that When we go before God destitute, God always brings up any sin in our life that may hinder his flow of his, the power of his spirit moving in our lives. And I think the heart of the, the mourning is over our own personal sin. When's the last time you mourned over your sin? Not your spouse's. Yours. Or your neighbor's. Or your pastor's. But yours. You know what I come to find out? Is that when I'll get into that secret place and I will go there and I will stay asking God to give me a glimpse of of his glory. In essence, what I'm saying, God, fill me. God, take control of me. God, I want my life to count. God, I want to see heaven come down to earth. And what I mean by that, I want to see your kingdom go forth. I want to see people come to know Jesus. I want to see people grow in Jesus. I want to see people that are in bondage, people that are sick. I want to see transformation. But I need to be transformed. God, I need to see you. Direct my prayers. Show me how to pray. Show me what I need to pray. It's one thing for me to go in and have a laundry list of what I want from God. It's a whole other ball game when I'm saying, God, I need to hear from you. Show me what you want where I can, in, 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 in essence, pray it into existence through faith in Christ. In the power of the Spirit. So Jesus says, anything you ask in my name, it will be done. Anything according to my will. Oh, if we just realize the power that we had. And if we would maintain... Um, persistent prayer and, and instead of just going in and, and doing this quick 30 second prayer saying God will you do this and just moving on and forgetting but laboring that's why Paul says you don't wrestle against flesh and blood the prince and power of this air he knows that I'm telling you when you start putting in practice what I'm talking about you start living but gain because you become a threat but here's the thing, as, as you walk through this and you're praying this and you're asking God to help you live again and to, and to dream again and to be used by him and to be a warrior for Christ. I mean, we have, have sissified and, and dumb, I mean, masculinity down to nothing. And I know that isn't politically correct, but I really don't care. And I don't mean that arrogantly. I don't, because God's called men to be men and women to be women and he's wired us this way. But it's time for us to have a backbone and realize we're called to be spiritual warriors. But here's the thing. If you're not first, if I'm not first willing to mourn over my own personal sin, how effective am I going to be or is God going to be in and through me? The answer is not very effective. What I've come to learn is that when I'm poor in spirit and I'm destitute before God, very, the very first thing God begins to show me is my own sin. Things that I've said that, mm, 
probably shouldn't have said. Things that I've, I've done that, that probably shouldn't have done. And then I, I have a, a thing. Either I can make light of it or I can own it. And so there, there's an owning to it. And as you own it, God, and you confess it, 1 John 1, 9, confess our sins, he's faithful and just what? To forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then all of a sudden, you become a clean vessel for God to, to fill. When we talk about filling the Spirit, it's not, the, if you know Christ, the Spirit of God lives inside of you. The question we're talking about, how much control does he have over your life? We're talking about yielding ourselves to God. The morning of our sin is a lost. And if you expect your prayers to be answered, if you expect to be blessed and to live anointed life, then there needs to be mourning over your own personal sin, and it will not happen if you do not slow down and meet with God. And even more than that, the idea of you being salt and light on this earth will not happen because you'll continue down that path. You know the biggest area that God convicts us, by the way? At least it seems to me. Or at least me, maybe not you. You can agree or disagree, but it's my mouth. It's things that I say. And often who I say it about. If you don't believe me, just, just spend some time with God. So God, just show me if there's anything that's in my life that needs to be confessed. I'm just going to sit here and, and I'm just going to clear my mind. And I'm just going to... Gonna, Seek to hear you and, and to meditate on your word. You'll be blown away how God will bring past conversations to your mind. It says, why would you say this? Why are you doing that? Verse 5, he says, blessed are the meek. We said this is controlled strength. Is Moses is an example. Obviously in that, in, in, in that meekness, as you're mourning, as you're being willing to ask God to examine your heart, you know what all of a sudden begins to happen? You begin to have compassion for those that's wronged you. And all of a sudden, you're willing to forgive. You're willing to let go. You're not operating out of your hurt. We're not going to be light. light. We're not going to be salt. We're living and operating out of our past hurt. To the point to where we're walking around with venom. I mean, if we take our hurt, we, we give it to the Lord, we let Him bring healing to us, then yes, we can, we can use our, our brokenness for His glory. But I mean, if we're walking around and we're slandering one another because we're hurt, we're wounded, and we're angry, and we're disconnected from the vine to the point of renewing our minds, we're not going to be salt and light. He says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. You know what God's teaching me right now? is that not everything that I want to confront needs to be confronted. One of the hardest lessons for me. Just because I know it doesn't mean that it needs to be said. Just because it's true doesn't mean that it needs to be said. Learning to just know when to speak and not when to speak. Learning to, to trust God. Asking God to bring my life under His Control, self-control, fruit of the Spirit. Verse 6. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. So here's the deal. You humble yourself before God. You examine your own life. You start forgiving others that have wronged you or even those that may not have even repented of their sin you start having compassion for them you're bringing your life under the control of the spirit of god all of a sudden you start having a heart for things pertaining to righteousness you you start desiring to see truly god's kingdom come forth you you start having a passion for the things of god i don't know how many of you struggle with 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 sugar with eating sweets and, and things of that nature. But this white sugar, it's a, it's, it's, it's a curse. <laughs> um, the more you eat it, the more you got to have of it. 
And the more you eat it, the more bland the healthy stuff becomes. But when you cut that stuff out or you cut it back, it's amazing how much better the rest of the good stuff tastes. It's the thing of the sin and the idols in our lives. All of a sudden, we start hungering and thirsting for the right things. But when we're feasting on the, the delicacies of the world, which aren't really delicacies at all, it's just garbage. It ruins our taste buds spiritually. Verse 7, he says, blessed are the merciful. Then all of a sudden, you, you start having mercy for people that you would have never had mercy for in a million years. Why? Because it's the Spirit of the God that's doing that in and through us. And so, all of that, and, and then you get to verse 8, he says, and, and we'll move, he says, blessed are the pure in heart. L literally, your motives are right. Because you, you've, you've gone through the process of where God, you've examined them before the throne room of God. There's a blessing, there's an anointing. And I'll tell you something, when we meet with God and we walk with God, this is a process that we're walking through. And God's doing this. And he's bringing transformation. And, and He's even examining our motives. And we talked last week as well about this. So there's a lot of things that's done, quote unquote, under the name of Jesus or under the banner of Jesus that may be good deeds, but they're certainly not about Jesus. And for those of us that were studying in times, we were talking, there's going to come a day that we're going to stand before Jesus at the Bema Seat, the Bema Seat, and we're going to give account. This is for Christians. We're going to be judged. This has nothing to do with heaven or hell. It's already been decided by the cross and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we're going to stand before God, and we're going to give an account. And He's going to test our works by fire. And those works that were done for wood, hay, and stuff, they're going to burn up. Why? Because our motives were wrong. We talked the talk, but our hearts were not right. You see, when Moses went on Mount Sinai, he received the law, which was external by and large, to show that no man could live up to this. But yet you go where Jesus goes on the mountainside, and he gives this Sermon on the Mount. It's a picture of that where it's not about the outside, it's about the inside. God wants to give you a new heart. Jeremiah talks about that. A new heart for him to walk with him, to know him, for his kingdom to go forth. And there's so much power that we possess when God possesses us. That literally we're to have dominion here, even in this fallen world, for God's glory and for his name's sake. You said, is there going to be persecution? Of course there is. Because that is when you, as well as myself, become a real true threat to the enemy. Notice verses 9 through 12. This is, well, excuse me, blessed are the peacemakers. Well, even in that, what do we do? When we're not walking with God, we, I mean, the enemy, I mean, he loves it because why? He loves to throw the grenade and blowing up relationships. Some of you right now, you're walking through stuff, you're dealing with stuff, you, in, in your flesh, what, what do you do? You, you, you pull the, out the grenade, you just throw it in there. Boom! And then we say, come to church, God, how great thou art. Right? God, would you help this situation? Well, how, how, do I, how am I supposed to help? Well, would you bring some lightning bolts down and just kind of take them out, because I'm done with them. I mean, that's our mindset, even though we don't think like that. But that's our behavior because it's like, you roll me, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You slap me, I'm going to slap you. You throw a grenade at me, I'm going to throw a grenade at you. And we're just constantly blowing stuff up all around us. And you know who's using us? The enemy. And not the Spirit. And not God. But he says there's a blessing, there's anointing on the peacemaker. So all of a sudden, you're, you're walking with God, you're destitute before God, and you're mourning over your own personal sin. And in that, you're, you're um, bringing, asking God to bring you under control, you know, strength under control with meekness. And you're, you're a peacemaker, you're exo examining your own motives, all of those things. Then you become this threat to the enemy. Why? Because all of a sudden, God's kingdom now is going forth in you, so it's going to go forth through you. And that's when game's on. 
verses 10 and following says blessed are those who are persecuted anybody ever been persecuted I didn't say treated bad for some sin or something that you've done that you shouldn't have done because we've all been there but but truly persecuted because the enemy was using someone to try to destroy you because you were living out the kingdom initiatives See, a lot of times we, we deal with a lot of conflict, but I'm of the belief that a lot of the conflict we deal with in many cases are, are, is stuff that we've created. And if we'll, we'll go through this process that we're talking about through the Beatitudes, it, it may bring us to the point, and Jesus will make, light of, make reference of this in this message before we're done, that if, if you've wronged someone, you've got to go back and get it right. That's, that's a hard issue. It's from a morning of your sin. You, you're going to have to go get it right when you're wrong. Most of, uh, I'm done. <laughs> I was with you up to that point. I'm not going back. You know what they did to us? Or did to me? But if you're going to truly be poor in spirit, you're going to follow God wherever he leads you. But he says there's a special blessing for those that are persecuted for righteousness sake. Why? Because you see God at a level you've never seen him before. And God is, is using you and your life to make a difference. You say, well, I don't see the difference. He is. Why? Because you're being salt and light. And see, this is where we as, as, a, as a church have got to get to the point of where we're ready to live. But in our living, it isn't bold and arrogant. You have boldness in the gospel, but not arrogant. It's not that we're just seeking political correctness. No. Matter of fact... When we live out the initiative God has called us to live, it's going to bring the attacks of the enemy. And in that, there's, there's a blessing, there's an order in that. We just have to make sure that the persecution is for righteousness' sakes and not arrogance. It's just for theirs is the kingdom of God. And then he says in 11 and 12, he says, Blessed are they that revile you uh, when you're reviled, not they that revile, but when they revile you and persecute you and say all kind of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Listen, if somebody is tearing you apart because of your love for Jesus Christ, praise God. And in some ways say, God, give me more. Help me be that man or woman. And then, he says, rejoice, be exceedingly glad. Great is your reward in heaven. Why? Because you've been tested by a fire. Because you're, you're going through this process and you're like, God, I just want to make sure my heart's right. I want to do the right things. Empower me, use me. Your kingdom go forth. And we just spent 25 minutes going back to the very verses that we were supposed to be on this morning to start. But to refresh our mind and everything we just heard, look at what verse 13 says again. You are the salt of the earth. In Jesus' day, salt was a, a very high commodity. Matter of fact, the Roman soldiers in many ways, many times were paid with blocks of salt. I was reading one commentary, and there was up to 40 different uses for salt. And I am by no means going to go through all 42 of those uses. But it was extremely um, important. It, 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 was, it was a high commodity. He says, you're salt. Now you think of salt, you, you think of the fact that, that salt seasons. It also preserves. In essence, I think we can make the argument that Jesus said, when you live out these beatitudes, you preserve your family, your community. You season your family, your community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of you, you're at that point where you're like, you know what, I, I'm, just, I, I'm just about ready to throw in the towel. Not, not that I would throw in the towel on God, but I'm just going to throw in the towel to where I'm just backing off, I'm just quitting, I'm just going to isolate myself, just going to sit down, I'm going to quit being on the offensive side, I'm just done, I'm just going to ride my time out. Friends, I want you to know that when you quit being the salt, that it's going to cost you mightily. It's going to cost your family. It's going to cost the community. It's going to cost this church. Because this is where God's called us to be. And then even more than that, 
the most miserable among miserable people is a believer living outside the will of God. And if that misery isn't enough to jolt you back to where you're supposed to be, God has no issue with taking you behind the woodshed and giving you an old-fashioned spiritual spanking. I realize it isn't politically correct. I realize that most kids, they don't even know what I'm talking about. But if you've walked with God long enough, you know exactly what I'm talking about. He says, but what if a salt loses its, 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 its flavor? It's not that, a, that salt ceases to be salt. But what happens is salt that is contaminated with, with dirty minerals and so forth, then it, it becomes worthless. And it's, it's, it's good for nothing. In, in this case, in many times, it was just thrown out to be trampled under uh, the, the foot of men. And, and here's, here's the, the illustration. If we allow the world and the love of this world to contaminate us, What type of preserving, what type of seasoning are we going to do or be? And the answer is nothing. The worst testimony of all is the one that says, I believe in Jesus, but I just don't want to live for him. I believe in Jesus, but, but I'm not really interested in those spiritual things. In many ways, if, if, if that's you verbally, I would question salvation. But here's the thing. That may not be you verbally, but in so many ways, that's where people are with their actions. And notice verse 14. It says, you're the light. You're, you're the light of the world. A city that's, that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. If the church would just allow her light to shine again, you imagine the hope that would be around us? He said, but the, the, the society by and large, they're just, just not interested. They don't, they don't want anything to do with it. And, and that is true. But you know why? The church has lost her voice. You ready? Here, here it is. The reason the church has lost its voice is the church does not live out what we just talked about in the Beatitudes instead of we've just been playing religion. And the church and the world's not interested in it. You show me a man or a woman that's empowered by the Spirit of God, I'll show you somebody that is being salt and light. Someone God is using to push hell back and for the kingdom to come forth in people's lives to be changed. I'll also show you somebody that's probably getting, going through a lot of, of persecution as well, but yet is rejoicing along the way because they know that God is refining them through it. In 1 Peter, we're almost done, but in 1 Peter 2, 9, Peter says that we are what? A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that we what? May proclaim the praises of him who what? Called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Psalms 119 says that the word is what? A lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The enemy has many people in darkness, but he doesn't have you in darkness. We've won. We have victory. God hasn't left us as orphans. We have a hope and a future. Philippians 2.15, he says that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You go back to Matthew 5 and you see where we were at and, and he talks about the fact that, that we should let our light shine, that, that, that a city on a hill can't be hidden. Notice what he says in verse 15 and 16. He says, nor do the light, they light a lamp, put it under a basket, but a lampstand because it gives light to the whole house. And in verse 16, 
It says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In essence, they will visually see God's hand on your life because of the anointing that's taken place and the transformation that's taken place. And it will be light that shines in darkness. You said, I don't feel too bright right now. Then you know what you need to do. You need to get along with God. You need to take the scriptures. You need to open the Beatitudes. And you need to pray through them. And in that, you need to, to say, God, I'm not leaving this place until I hear from you. Bless me. Use me. And let God do his thing. God's never intended this to be, go get them, boys. Go get them. I'm, I'm here behind you. It's never designed that way. God says, you can't do it, but I'll do it. I just need you to yield and get out of the way to let me live through you. Give your life to me and continue to give your life to me and I'll empower you to be the man or woman I've created you to be to where you can have dominion and power rest upon your life. It's just that simple. You say, what did you do to get saved? I didn't do nothing but believe. How do you live the Christian life? You believe and you trust and you yield the same way you did when you got saved. And that's what we're called to do. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. We've heard the word and the question becomes, what do we do with it? Where, where are you? Do you? Are you that salt? Are you that, that light? Is God doing his work in and through you because he wants to. James once again says you have not because you ask not. What's your prayer life look like? Are you dreaming about what God can do through you? Or are you just existing? Or better yet, are you waiting for somebody else to, to, to step up and do what you know that God's called you to do? Father, we give this invitation to you. God, we know that apart from you, we are nothing. God, we're asking that you would just continue to fill us with your spirit. That you would transform our lives. That you would give us a heart for your word and for prayer and for one another. God, that you would help us to be salt and light to those that are around us for the purpose of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and bringing hope into people's lives. God, help us understand that this isn't a religious relationship. And Lord, as we transition to sing this invitation song to give your people an opportunity to respond, Lord, I pray that if they feel led to go to this altar and pray for themselves, for this nation, for someone in their lives, someone in their community, Father, I pray they'll come. And Lord, we just, we're just looking to you and we're giving this to you. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.